Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Right, um, hopefully that's uh, the technology problem overcome. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you about was um, basically some new approaches to ancient glacial sediments. And I think in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, um, you have some of the best glacial sediments in the world's hottest place. And um, so I'm going to um, talk a little bit about those sediments today. Um, and I'm going to try and give you an introduction to some of the problems associated with uh, glacial sediments and also ways that we can address them. So I'll start off the presentation uh, by firstly uh, saying that uh, the, the research that you, you do, obviously, is not a solo effort. And uh, there are a, a large number of people that have contributed to the slides that you will see in the next uh, few moments. Uh, and this is just a, a small selection. Uh, in the audience, um, I see Saeed to five. Uh, so at least one of the one of you is there and if there's anyone I've forgotten then um, I, I'm very sorry. Okay, so um, obviously if you live in in the Middle East then um, you're not used to seeing ice creeping across the landscape um, modifying the um, modifying the basins but here in Austria where I live we've got fabulous uh, opportunities to see modern day glaciers such as this, the, the Pasteitze glacier. And um, quite um, typically what you see is a big ice fall, ice tumbling over the side of, of the mountain and then it flows down into, the, um, into the, the basin, into the valley that it's carved and then gradually creeps down uh, towards, uh, in this case, towards a lake. And when you look at it, when you walk on it, what you notice is that the, the, the surface is not uh, entirely white and icy and clean. In fact, it looks um, a little bit different. Um, so what we're interested in is how this ice um, erodes and transports and then releases the material as it melts. And this is not something that's, that's happened um, just in the last 25,000 years or so. The history of uh, ice on Earth is a long one. Uh, from about 2.2 billion years to the present day. And we could make a simple um, picture like this uh, to say, well, we've got ice ages at 2.2 billion years, lots of iron stones then, South Africa, Australia have a lot of those. And then we've got a cluster of ice ages that I show in blue, which are to do with the snowball earth events. I'll show you a couple of examples of these in the talk. And then those ice ages in yellow are the Paleozoic ones, the, those that we associate with in Saudi Arabia, the Sara formation at 443 million years and the Anasa formation uh, at 350 to 290 million years, very broadly um, with the correlative rocks um, finding ov over the border in Oman, uh, where they're called the Al Khlata formation. So that's very nice and you know these rocks are very interesting but one of the big questions is um, what's normal? What's normal in the in the way that ice moves and um, what's normal in the way that the earth appears to us as, as geologists? And in this image we've got on the left hand side the earth today and an image of how the earth may have looked 720 million years ago and of course what is normal is a big question. When you compare these different ice ages and the glacial deposits they leave behind, um, you need to explain quite a few differences between them in terms of the sedimentary record. And so this is a new normal, perhaps. This is an image I found on the BBC website just two hours ago. And um, what you observe is that, um, are we approaching a point of no return? Is this what the earth will look like in the future? is it indeed what the earth looked like in the Cretaceous, okay? But that's not something we're really able to tackle today. We're really interested in, in getting to grips with the glacial deposits. So where this all began was really with um, the amazing work of Louis Agassiz. And 
Louis Agassiz was a, um, a uh, scientist from, from Switzerland and he spent a lot of time walking around the Swiss Alps and observed that there were a lot of materials, unstratified gravel or boulder drift as he called it in this, in this quote, which he um, thought was directly deposited by ice. Um, and it's an incredibly powerful interpretation because what happened was he went over to Scotland and he started seeing similar things um, in 1840, shortly after the publication of his um, uh, the Ice Site, the Ice Age um, volume. And so this is really where the connection with the modern day glaciers and the ancient um, the ancient landscape, whether it's a few thousands of years old or a few tens of millions of years old or billions of years old, that connection with the modern day record is very important. Okay, so we can think about glaciers a bit like this, which um, may surprise a few people. This is the surface of the Pasterza glacier in, in the um, Austrian Alps. And the photo was taken last August, August 2018. And it looks like um, a bouldery, um, desert. But in fact, this is the surface of the ice and what you see is material that's fallen down onto the surface and poking um, through between those blocks you see the glacier. So we can think of a, of a glacier like this as a conveyor belt and that conveyor belt produces diamecton, material that's poorly sorted with very, very angular um, clasts that you can see and very, very little evidence for reworking of the material, literally fallen on top of the glacier and gets transported down uh, towards the, the end of the valley. Okay, where life gets complicated is the introduction of meltwater and this is uh, walking down that glacier about uh, a kilometre further down. You can see the ice fall in the background still but on this, this is still the surface of the glacier, what's actually on top of the ice. And you see these big piles of, of, of sediment. And in between those blocks, we now have um, finer grained sand and gravel. And there's a little meltwater channel you can see on the surface that's reworking all of that material very, very effectively. And this is the story of uh, much of the Paleozoic record, for example, what we have in Saudi Arabia in the Sahara Formation. I'm oversimplifying things very, very much, but just to give you the, the flavour, and we start to see just a little bit of reworking, and you get um, stratified sands and gravels like this, interbedded with um, with the the diamects, the poorly sorted materials. Okay. So I'm going to go straight to Saudi Arabia because. This is a, um, a webinar that's based in Saudi Arabia and I think it's of great relevance to you. And this is some of the great work that um, Saeed Tafaif did. Um, we did together for his, um, his research projects when he was based at, uh, at Royal Holloway University of London. And we did some field work around the Al-Wazam area, around Tabuk. And what you see is um, around the Arabian Shield in that bottom picture, that there are paleo valleys that radiate around the shield area and they're really well well defined and easy to demonstrate to outcrop that doesn't mean they're not complicated and we'll, we'll think a, a lot about that later um, but what you can see in this um, image here is in the middle there's um, a google earth photo and on the right there's an interpretation and there are two cross-cutting paleo valleys that you can see that um, form the basis of this paper in um, a Geological Society special publication that came out this year. So what, what we did was we looked at these, these cross-cutting paleo valleys and studied the sediments inside them. And what we can see is we can see good clues for glaciation. We can see in the top left some striated pebbles that are um, beautifully obvious. And um, I don't know whether people can actually see my, me or my webcam at the moment, but I have some, some extra things with me. Um, I'll see if this works. Can you see me? 
hopefully. Um, so we see some, some fabulous things like this, these polished and striated pebbles, um, which literally lie everywhere around the area. And maybe even more interestingly, and this is an example that I've taken from Libya actually, but you find the same things in Saudi Arabia, these wonderful fragments of striated surface. So they're, they're grooves which have been produced in soft sand as the ice has ridden over the top of them. So um, we see pieces of evidence for the action of ice on the surface like this in the Al Wazam area. Okay, so um, moving on, um, here's um, Saeed Tafaif and you can see him standing on one of these amazing striated surfaces um, that um, we published a small um, a chapter in a book on Earth's ancient um, ice ages um, earlier this year. And uh, this evidence is widespread around the Arabian Shield. Okay, so what we do is go back to the presentation. Um, and when you look at these paleo valleys, they're really clear to it's really easy to convince yourself that there is something there to observe. It's not just a, a, a fantasy interpretation because on the left of this um, slide, you see at the top, there are layer cake deposits that are pre-glacial. And then the yellow line shows how a Paleo Valley has cut into these pre-glacial Ordovician deposits, marine deposits with lots of bioturbation inside and that the glacial deposits themselves are really quite complex with um, lots of weird structures, such as what we see in the bottom left-hand corner, these um, shoot and pull type structures, very high angle uh, sedimentary structures. And uh, on the right-hand side at the bottom, uh, very, very thick continuous intervals of these fasces. And this is an area that is becoming very rapidly um, is advancing very rapidly and there's um, currently a special um, special issue of sedimentology that's being um, edited uh, that is dealing with these kinds of fasces and the, the general thinking is that they are produced through um, uh, hyper concentrated uh, flows through sustained flows and uh, fall under the category of uh, supercritical uh, flow deposits. So this is an emerging field and it's probably a, a one of the reasons why in the past people have found this formation and these deposits so very difficult to to understand and to interpret. Okay, these are some of Saeed's uh, wonderful logs produced across the um, al Wazam Paleo Valley and painstakingly done and um, what what he did with some input from me, but largely um, on his own, um, was these, these profiles um, which were spaced in very, very closely, sometimes tens of meters apart, 50 meters apart, but very close. And a lot of effort was made to walk along the outcrops to see the transitions between the sedimentary facies. And as we were doing this, I think it's fair to say that we became a little bit depressed because it became obvious that, that matching the patterns was very, very difficult to do. What you see on the screen um, is a series of different colours. Doesn't really matter what they are, apart from to tell you that the yellow colours are very deformed uh, sandstones and the green colours tend to be these very odd um, structures. They look a bit like floppy pancakes. Uh, that, that you, you um, pile one on top of the other after having cooked them that may be related to these um, supercritical flows. The point is that there seems to be no obvious pattern to this within the scale of a Paleo Valley. And so I think, um, and we agreed on, on this perhaps, that uh, it's impossible to correlate with a clear conscience at the outcrop scale. Even if you walk along the outcrop and try to correlate the rocks. You could try it, but then again, arguably you would be forcing the correlation and that would be bad 
practice in science and um, more specifically in sedimentology and stratigraphy and your model is likely to unravel very quickly. So what can we learn from this? We can learn that these problems plague people that look at ancient glacial deposits and drive them crazy. That's to say that these solutions to, to these kinds of problems still remains um, um, enigmatic. So we need to do more work to try and correlate these rocks um, objectively and um, embracing new techniques, which I'll be talking about in the next few minutes. Okay, so you can try this, you can try correlations. This is another correlation that uh, one of my former master's students, Jörg Lang, now um, at the University of Hanover and I did from Algeria. And these are well logs that are sunk in the Elitzi Basin where the late Ordovician glacial deposits are a big gas reservoir. And what you observe is that you can try, you, you can make a, a case for correlation, okay? With incisions at different levels, different letters that you see, SB means sequence boundary, GES means glacial erosion surface, and so on. But that's, that's fine. And you can try and do that with a, um, with a, a log data set like this. But still the questions come back. If there are high uncertainties at outcrop, what about the subsurface? Data like this at several kilometers depth, how objective is this and how model driven is the correlation? And um, how can this reduce the uncertainty uh, in the connect connection of sandstones that you would see in the subsurface of these basins? Okay, so one solution or one area that I think is quite refreshing is to look at um, things from above. Um, as geologists, we've got a very um, strong habit, a very good habit of going to the outcrop and describing things properly. But one area that we haven't really um, got to grips with is satellite imagery to understand um, ancient glacial rocks and um, aerial photographs until very, very recently. And there's now um, several papers in the last couple of years that are, are bringing this te these techniques to the forefront of, of, of the science. And so this is an area um, that you see on your screens that comes from um, the Enedi Borku range in Chad. And um, one of my current uh, students, um, Christoph Kettler, who may be watching this uh, at the moment, is currently working on this mapping uh, some incredible structures. I'll show you some examples in a minute. So we're using satellite images, Mavic Pro drones and so on to, to try to, to bring this all together. And yeah, how do we do this? Well, obviously we look at modern and ancient um, glacial land surfaces together because we can learn a lot from the modern, we can learn a lot from the Pleistocene, and we can apply these learnings to the ancient record, but also sometimes the other way around. So we see lots of things in the late Ordovician record that are not so common. For example, um, tunnel valleys are not so common in many other records, apart from Pleistocene records. So we can, it's a two-way exchange of, of information. This is probably my favorite house. If I, if I had a house, I'd live in this house. It's sitting on an incredible striated uh, pavement in, in Canada. Okay, so we use what we see at modern day glaciers and just work back through time. And probably one of the most important developments, um, I think, in the last 20 years is our understanding of how the Antarctic ice sheet works in a lot of detail. And I'll show you this movie, which um, basically demonstrates that Antarctica um, is covered by very heterogeneous ice. There are arteries that flow through the Antarctic ice sheet that we know a lot about now, which are called ice streams. And the areas which are flowing fastest are shown in purple and blue, and the areas which are flowing more slowly are flowing in green and yellow. And what you see is that all of the ice is piling into to channels, big, big channels over the scale of the continent. And uh, those um, channels are 
carrying most of the ice towards the sea and also the sediments with it. So it's models like this that we've used to understand the configuration of ancient ice sheets. And that's really important for the ancient record because they're places where, where erosion is concentrated, where sediment is, is able to be transported very effectively, and we can understand the sedimentary systems much better through thinking about these um, con ice sheet configurations. Okay, good. So, one thing I should say before going further is that we see lots of grooves and scratches, and I'll talk a bit more about those in a minute, but you can look at the ancient record and um, look for evidence for ancient glacial grooves and scratches in the, the Neoproterozoic, for example, in the Cryogenian and in the Ediacaran, and they're extremely rare. You, you only find them in, in places like, like China. We have a current student, uh, Mr. Zhao Shui Chen, who's currently here in Vienna, looking at, at these structures for part of his project. You see them only in, in very rare places. And you've got to be very careful and able to, to demonstrate that you have extra evidence for glaciation, not just scratches. Because in this example that we see on the screen, we've got uh, large scale grooves that are produced through underwater landslides, which are of about the right age um, in the Himalayas, but have absolutely nothing to do with glaciation at all. So we have to be very careful. And we also have to be very careful when we see poorly sorted sediments and materials. And I've got two examples here um, on the screen. So the word diamecton refers to material that's, that's loose and unconsolidated, and the word diamectite refers to the material once it has undergone diagenesis and produces a hard rock. And so both of these examples come from Ontario in Canada. Uh, and um, on the top, we have a very famous um, deposit, the Galganda Formation, which was deposited about 2.2 billion years ago. And in that, in that uh, diamectite, you see that there's big um, rounded pebbles of granite. And in the bottom, we see something a bit similar. It's a bit younger, it's 1.8 billion years old, and it's called the Sudbury Breccia. And if you look at these in the field, you think automatically that they're deposited by a similar process. The fundamental difference is that the one at the top contains extra evidence for, for glaciation, which I will uh, describe in a, in a minute. The one at the bottom is deposited through a meteorite impact, uh, the Sudbury uh, meteorite impact at 1.8 billion years. And you see examples of shatter cones on the right hand side produced through the, 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 the high impact um, product of, of, well, fundamentally the, the impact itself on the earth giving you these, these shatter cones. So you have to be very careful. And so that means also in the rock record, and here's some more work that I, I did with um, Saeed Tafaif, um, his second part of his project. Um, we have often glacial and non-glacial diamectites, poorly sorted deposits, all mixed up together. Okay. Um, hopefully you can still hear me. Um, and that's, that's a big problem um, because what we, what we often find is a great challenge to determine um, whether something is really, really glacial or not. And I don't know if you can see this on, on my webcam or not, possibly, possibly not, um, but uh, Diamectites like this, 720 million years old, um, are uh, very hard to, to interpret if you just see them without supporting evidence of glaciation. And what we have in this model is you see that basically there's an ice sheet coming from the left to the right. And the bad, bad news for the sedimentologist is that as well as the glaciation, there's some um, extensional tectonics taking place. 
And that means that we have faults which are active and those faults produce um, a series of um, allistostromes, so gravitational collapse deposits. So you have poorly sorted material that's just derived from slope collapse mixed in with materials that are truly glacial in origin. So we have a bit of a problem on our hands. In this diagram, what you also see is that you've got, in addition to these flows going down into the basin, so glaciogenic debris flows giving you glacial diamictites and allistostromes going down the slope giving you non-glacial diamictites. We've also got in the background little icebergs that are breaking off the ice front and they're transporting material with them. And those icebergs will float out to sea or out into a lake and melt, giving you ice rafted debris or IRD, which is the abbreviation in this diagram. So we have a lot of um, uh, a lot of work to do. And what we do is um, here's another example um, of some some logs from um, these ancient rocks. These are from Death Valley, I should have said, in California. And uh, from the bottom um, at the bottom left hand side to the top. Um, on the right of the diagram, you see different colours and the most important thing is that there's light blue colours and dark blue colours. And the dark blue colours come in many, many times uh, and they're to do with slope collapse, uh, big, big blocks moving down slope uh, by faulting, whereas the, the lighter blue uh, deposits are true glacial, um, cl true glacial diamectites. And you might think, how do we know that? If you proved that there is um, slope collapse, how do you know that these blue, light blue deposits are glacial? Um, well, the answer lies in, in drop stones that we see. Um, so uh, small clasts that have fallen out of the iceberg, rain down onto the sea floor to forming the seabed. So show you some examples of those in a minute. But one of the problems we um, have is that sometimes we don't find things like drop stones. So evidence for glaciation remains very, very weak in some sedimentary records. And so we have to look deeper. So what we have here is we have an example of a diamictite that's 2.2 billion years old from South Africa that my current uh, MSc student Sabine Vimmer is working on. And this core has been into a CT scanner. It's very common in industry standard in, um, in terms of trying to understand fabrics uh, in the oil industry. Oops, it hasn't worked. Let's see if I can make it work. You rotate it and what you can do is isolate some of the, the structures inside and you can start to see the individual pebbles. You can look for, for fabric, so orientation of clasts. You can remove the matrix and then from that you can extract some, some quantitative um, information. So we're able to do lots of clever macro fabric analysis um, using standard um, uh, structural geology software, uh, standard 3D modeling software such as using Blender Cinema 4D. Um, but requires quite a lot of effort to extract that information. And that's useful for trying to understand flow direction if you don't see things like ripples or cross bedding in a glacial succession. Maybe understand which direction the ice was flowing. But usually you've got things like this, okay? In these very ancient Neoproterozoic deposits, I've got an example from Death Valley at the bottom left. So we see big drop stones. We know that there were no dinosaurs at the time that might have accidentally had a very bad breakfast, eaten a drop stone and gone for a swim. We know that there was no um, ability for um, stones to, to cling onto the bottom of roots. And as trees die or swept out to sea during a storm, that's another way to produce a drop stone. For deposits like this that are so old, 720 million years old, 2.2 billion years old, no problem at all. So really good supporting evidence um, is these drop stones. Okay. 
what else? Um, one of the things that you will notice um, is that people approach the glacial record, glacial sedimentology in slightly different ways depending on the age of the glaciation, depending on the age of the sediment. And this amazing map that you see on the screen, um, part of the uh, results of Britice, a big consortium that brought together a lot of people in the UK to reconstruct the, in detail the British and Irish ice sheet for the, um, in, in the most detailed possible way, has just um, come to completion. And the colours don't matter. The main thing that does matter is that there are firstly a lot of colours and there are a lot of different features. And that means that we have a luxury, a great luxury we have an enormous amount of data that we can use to reconstruct ancient ice sheets in the Quaternary. Okay, even offshore data, seismic data in the North Sea, looking for tunnel valleys, all of that can be integrated. So we've got so much data. Often the, um, the question focuses on, on rather localised areas. If you contrast that directly to some of the um, um, the sections that, that Chen is working on for his PhD um, in Beijing, um, you have a completely different picture and you have vegetation all over the place like this, you have metamorphism to think about, you have a lot of tectonics and erosion to think about and that means that the, the record of ancient glaciation is much more patchy and it means that it's much more um, difficult to make a detailed reconstruction. Luckily you can come across things like this, in fact these, these don't come from uh, the Xi'an re region, they come from, um, from northwestern China, from the Taklamakan desert, uh, but the point is they're still very fragmentary in, in nature. Okay, so um, what I want to do is show you a few examples of, of glaciations in the Sahara. Um, because I think this can be readily transported to um, what we see in Saudi Arabia and to understanding the glacial record more generally. Why the Sahara? Uh, I spent 10 years working there, not in one go, but in many different field seasons. And that gave me a wonderful opportunity to look at different outcrops and to try and put them uh, together in a, in a meaningful model. And I start off with a small fieldwork incident that I think uh, it was easy to solve, a, an engine that died in the desert, uh, the solution was to lift the engine out and then drop it on the ground accidentally and it worked perfectly uh, from there on in. So in the Sahara what we, we have is a spectacular 443 million years old glaciation. We have deposits that are of identical age and very similar in style to what what you see in Saudi Arabia in the Sahara Formation. It's a very strange glaciation. Most of the deposits are sandstone. I've shown you examples from modern day glaciers from the near Proterozoic, from the Paleoproterozoic that are, are totally different. And the question is um, what, why this was the case. The thinking is generally that you have multiple phases of recycling of material from the beginning of the Cambrian onwards since the Pan-African orogeny giving you very very mature um, quartz aronites. And the other major difference is that uh, again like most of the deposits uh, that have been published on in Saudi Arabia we have uh, evidence for glacial grooves cut into soft sand rather than into hard rock. So these are two big differences. So at this time, 443 million years ago, North Africa sitting under the South Pole. And these glacial grooves are very widespread. I started off with some art examples from, from Saudi Arabia near Tabuk. And here we have the Kufra Basin in southeastern Libya, very similar structures. We have an unconformity at the bottom that you can see that the scale of the unconformity cutting hundreds of meters down into underlying uh, deposits. So these are very, very common things indeed. So we know what happens when the 
when the glaciers move across the substrate, they produce big grooves. And these grooves can actually be scaled up. You can start to see them on satellite imagery. And this was something that was quite amazing when it um, first became apparent um, about 15 years ago, um, because satellite data was previously expensive, hard to get hold of, you had to pay for it. Now you can look at it on, on Google Earth and check these interpretations for yourself. And what you see on the left is, is lots of large scale grooves that are called mega scale glacial lineations, and they snake their way up through the desert from the south to the north. And they form a belt that's about um, 100 kilometers long and uh, 50 kilometers wide. And in this part of the world, again concentrating on the left hand side of the of the screen we see that there's a second phase of of lineations that cross cut the first suggesting that we've got complex reworking of materials through successive glaciations and so this was brilliant this was the work predominantly of julian moreau which i was involved in but he was uh, driving this uh, as part of his phd and then on the right hand side, we can take this idea and run with it and start to see um, other examples across the, the deserts across the Sahara. And in the right hand side, again, mega scale glacial lineations that we, we ground checked and you ground truthed, you could see striations on the, uh, on the floor in the deserts that parallel to these structures and being very careful to distinguish them from things like faults and unconformities and other things, maybe aeolian dunes that you could easily mistake for these uh, glacial lineations. Okay, so these are, these are really important things because they're very widespread. And you see them in the Sahara so well because the rocks are very shallowly dipping, almost, almost horizontal at the margins of places like the Mazuk Basin or the Kufra Basin. So you've got the story of ice flow and then you've got the story of what happens when the uh, ice starts to die and starts to release meltwater. And you see things like this. All of these look like they are the same outcrop, but they're about 4,000 kilometers apart from Saudi Arabia in the top, through Algeria in the middle to Morocco in the bottom. And all of them are irregularly based valleys, just like the ones I showed you from um, from uh, Al Wizam in Saudi Arabia in the Tafai Fatal paper. And these huge uh, meltwater valleys occur over wide, wide areas. So, very easy to observe, very easy to describe, and also in the subsurface in, on seismic data, fairly easy to image in some places, which is amazing. You can make a good connection between outcrop and subsurface data. So, um, where rocks are buried up to two or three kilometers in, in beneath the surface. So what we tried to do was to make a, a geo fantasy, okay, or a, a reconstruction, let's say. Uh, it's always good to try and be self-critical about these things, but um, what the map shows at the top is it shows a reconstruction of the ice sheet 443 million years ago in the late Ordovician in North Africa. Remembering that this ice sheet extended round to the Arabian Peninsula and covered uh, the um, Tabuk area that we described previously. And what we see is large scale ice streams, as we know these exist in, in Antarctica, these ice streams produce these large scale glacial um, megalineations or these mega scale glacial lineations. And uh, we can make interpretations for the orientations of these and their continuation into the subsurface based on seismic data, most of which is not publicly available, except for a little bit that Julian Moreau has done uh, with Total uh, in the course of his postdoctoral work about 13 years ago. So we can zoom in on that, on that image and look at the bottom and uh, the retreat from the maximum so as the ice is retreating back it releases melt water and that's when these big paleo valleys get produced and they occur all the way around the Tassili Niger region this map is not my own this um, of the um, valleys in the Tassili Niger I've superimposed them there and tried to link them up 
but they were mapped in the early uh, 70s by Serge Berf et al in an amazing piece of work um, done um, with um, a team of French scientists. So this, this image at the bottom links up um, paleo valleys that you can see in the subsurface to the south of the Gargaff Arch at about three kilometres depth to those that occur at outcrop in one, in one unified model. And it's nice and I'd like to say it's, it's correct, but actually there's huge gaps. And the problem is that many of these outcrops occur at modern day basin margins and in between you have no outcrop. So you're always going to have an incomplete view of an ancient ice sheet. And that's really important to recognise um, when, when images like this are seen. Far from perfect and um, most likely uh, wrong in, in some uh, key areas. So anyway, the main thing is that we can make links between outcrop and subsurface information. And these very famous images from in the left, what we have in subsurface Saudi Arabia, the Zarqa Sara uh, Paleo Valley that's shown here, cutting down into the um, into underlying Canberra Ordovician deposits with parallel um, reflectors and a very similar image that comes from um, from from Libya from the right hand side uh, from the Mazuk Basin. And so we make we must make use of, of different types of data. We must in, integrate outcrop data, seismic data well log data that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, everything that's available at our fingertips to make these reconstructions. And there's good news for everybody that uh, sometimes um, some of this geology gets a bit difficult at outcrop and the outcrops can be hard to interpret. And at the bottom I've got my colleague Marie Busfield who's uh, a lecturer at um, Aberystwyth University, uh, another expert in, in glacial sedimentology. And what she's looking at is the mineral for formation in Utah and pebbles that have been highly stretched out through uh, metamorphic and tectonic processes. So sometimes uh, the outcrop geology doesn't prove to be particularly useful um, in, our, um, in our approaches. It's vital that we look at the rocks, but sometimes we get unexpected information like this. And you can't really make much of this apart from to say that it was a deformed diamictite. So what we do in these circumstances where rocks are heavily deformed or very difficult to access or where their spatial relationships are hard to understand is we have to get creative. And the first option is to look down a microscope and to do um, some micromorphology. So very careful thin section analysis, fabric analysis, measurements of, of, of fabrics, really a bit like um, we would do for a, a metamorphic fabric to try to tease out information about ice flow directions. Or alternatively, um, to look at things from, from above. And um, what I would like to do now is to provide you an example of how to do some lazy armchair science. Um, so the mission that we have is to find an ice sheet in the desert. And this ice sheet exists whenever you open up Google Earth and you can see it and examine it for yourself um, after this, this webinar. Why have I suspected that there's an ice sheet there? It's simply through having done some quite a lot of field work in, in the Kufra Basin in Libya. And just over the, the, the Chad border in the um, Enedi uh, Borku range, we have a succession of um, Paleozoic rocks that's dipping towards the north. And this is a place that's a frontier area for oil exploration at the moment. And there's a, a renewed um, attempt to, 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 to look for oil and gas in the in the lower Paleozoic succession in Chad right now. And what I want to show you is some features that we've been looking at in, in the Carboniferous record, starting off with me and some, some great new work that Christoph Kepler has been doing for his, his PhD here in Vienna. And a couple of different study areas, so study, study area one and study area two. 
So these are sections that are um, covering the, the Carboniferous rocks. And what you see on Google Earth is you see structures that are identical to what we have in the Ordovician in, in Libya. And uh, these are large mega scale glacial lineations that you can trace across a very shallowly dipping plateau area. And they are um, cropping out over um, a very, very wide area, hundreds of kilometers. And so what we're able to do is I show you the solution on the right and then I try to convince you that this is the case, is we can, we're able to produce a, an ice sheet reconstruction on the right hand side with some considerable uncertainty in how the southern part of it is, is seen. To the left of that ice sheet reconstruction, again looking at the top right hand corner of the, of the screen, we have some, some arrows which uh, indicate um, uh, glacial deposits, diamectites, drop stones and striations that are found in, in Niger in rocks of the same age. So we're pretty sure that these, these deposits are, are, um, are glacial and uh, form part of a, a reasonably large scale ice sheet. So what we want to do is look at these rocks in a bit more detail. This was a first attempt and I think much, much more will come out of this area in the future. We're looking at a Google Earth image here. And what I want to show you is what I think the mega scale glacial lineations are, where the boundaries of the ice stream are, and some very interesting meltwater channels that we will, we will talk about. This is all unpublished work. And we can see here in this um, image, we have some mega scale glacial lineations going from the north to the south like that. And it's a very, very pervasive fabric that you see across the, the desert. Towards the north of this, we've got modern day wadis that are draining towards the, the north into, into Libya. So we can outline the, the occurrence of the mega scale glacial lineations like that. And then to the right, if you observe to the right, this is really exciting stuff. We can see some, some channels, some big channels that have never been described. And these channels we're going to look at in a little bit more detail. And this is the, the topic of um, one of the, the main topics of Christoph's current work um, for his PhD. Um, we're tentatively interpreting them as pro-glacial meltwater channels um, that are cut into mud and filled with sand. And I'll try and explain why that's the case. OK, so we're going to zoom in and the image will change a little bit in color because we're going to change from Google Earth images to Bing maps, which seem to be a little bit better quality in this area. OK, it's the same area. So we're zooming in a, a little bit more and hopefully you can start to see on the right hand side this big belt of channels, which is appearing right next to the mega scale glacial lineations. And we're zooming into detailed view um, like so. And you see these, this spectacular knotted fabric of channels um, cross cutting one another. We know they're very old. We can see that there's all sorts of fractures going through them. And we interpret them as being filled with sandstone and being cut into mudstone because they're standing out in, in positive relief, in inverted relief on the desert plain. That suggests that the channels have been cut into a soft material filled with sand. They've then undergone diagenesis and some process that leads to the fracturing before being exhumed, eroded. So the, the surrounding material gets blown away by the desert winds. And then you see these fabulous um, structures uh, in the desert today. So we can look at these and see that there are multiple generations of channels next to this um, um, next to these mega scale glacial lineations. And it's important to, to say that these um, mega scale glacial lineations, these glacial deposits are carboniferous in age. Previous mapping has found that there's evidence for plant fossils associated with them, so they can't be Ordovician in age. OK, so you get an idea of the scale of these. Another view of these, if we go down towards the south of the channel belt, we see some spectacular examples of, of meandering river structures um, that um, clearly 
show all sorts of complex cross-cutting relationships, multiple generations of channels, again, probably cut into mudstone and filled with sandstone. So you can do a lot of work with these in terms of the size and scale of these and perhaps could be useful analogues for either one or other of the, the glaciations in Saudi Arabia in, in part. Okay, good. So um, this is not the end of the talk, but it's uh, the end of this small section uh, because I wanted to give you uh, an example of lazy science. So I, in the, the finest traditions of lazy science, we have to thank our armchair in order to have the time to look at Google Earth. We need to thank our cup of coffee to, to think about these structures and to test whether these hypotheses work. And of course, the, the British weather or the European weather for keeping us inside to actually do the desk-based geology. Good. So to the next, the next phase of the presentation, I still want to keep thinking about looking at things from above. And um, I'm gonna take you to South Africa, to rocks that are of age equivalence to the Onesa formation in, in Saudi Arabia, or to the Al Khlata formation in Oman. And we are, of course, talking about the famous Dwika formation in South Africa and Namibia. And what you see in the background are table-like um, uh, plateau hills made up of diamictite. And to put you in context here, I've deliberately waited here, uh, waited for this slide until now because I can put our Chad ice sheet into the reconstruction. So our new ice sheet in Chad sits up there in the northern part of Africa. We're talking about the uh, southwestern corner of Africa at the moment, so interface between um, ice sheets and the marine environment. And this came from um, the review paper that we did in 2009, but ultimately derived from, from Nick Isles's um, reconstruction. So just to be clear about the citation there. And um, Saudi Arabia, of course, at this time, still connected to um, still connected to northeastern Africa, where in this reconstruction, non-marine deposits are shown. And uh, for some reason, in this old reconstruction, no evidence for, for ice, which we now know is, is not the case. So in this picture, we had large ice sheets growing over uh, central and southern Africa. And the general picture is one of ice flowing down from highlands into a basin, okay? And why were these deposits important? Well, obviously in our context, thinking about um, most of the audience today coming from um, the Middle East, we're interested in, in late Paleozoic um, glacial deposits for hydrocarbon reservoirs and also for water reservoirs. So as reservoirs of, of fluid resources in some reason, for, in, in some way. But uh, they're also important in the history of, of geology because they, alongside um, the uh, classic plant fossils we had in Gondwana, the Glossopteris, Scangamopteris um, uh, flora, for example, were able to um, to make a com convincing, compelling case, people like Wegener and um, Eugenie Dutoy in the early 20th century for, for continental drift, that these basins once sat together. So the, this is another historical reason why these deposits are important. So let's have a look at them. Let's look at these South African deposits. And we see lots of um, diamectites, picture in the, in the, in the top right. Um, with um, the, the pebble, the boulder is embedded into the diamectite with clear scratches on it. Here's one at the bottom, you, you can see again with clear scratches. And looking at the map, the general picture of ice flow from the north and from the south together, joining into a, a kind of um, trunk ice flow towards the west and out into South um, America. So what we wanted to do was try and think about these deposits a bit more carefully because um, what happens um, as uh, ice masses collapse and as we enter interglacial periods 
it's really important. It's important for sedimentology, for understanding, understanding facies distributions, and it's also important from a climatic perspective, what we can extract from the ancient rock record to look at the processes of, of ice retreat, and as that uh, retreating ice mass um, has its record sealed within the, the, the sediments, we have a, a fabulous opportunity to think about how the earth moves from glacial to post-glacial processes. So we had a special look at these um, glacial um, erosion surfaces and unconformities in South Africa. And so what we did was we just took a drone and um, one of my colleagues here said, hey, do you want to take a drone with you on field work? And I thought to myself, this is a bit dangerous. I'm very likely to crash it. And I hope he's not listening because I may have just crashed it. But the important thing is that I got some, some nice images of, of the land surface. And this is a great way of actually uh, bringing together outcrop geology, what you see on the ground, what you can measure with a compass and your notebook using your hammer, the satellite images at the largest scale and really something in between. So we just need a bird's eye view of things to understand how, um, how these um, glacially scratched and grooved unconformities are formed. So we're looking at um, a picture of um, the Orlogs Kloof glacial surface in um, South Africa. And uh, we went out there last March and did this work with the drone for the first time. So just recently published in Geology, open access, free and easy to download. And what you do when you look at this is you, um, you have to start to think, what can I map and what can I see that I can map objectively? And so what we tend to do is we need a, a view from above looking directly down like a bird onto the surface. And we, we stitch together a lot of different photographs and make sure there's no distortion. And uh, that allows us to produce a base map on which we can, we can map structures. And that's what we, we do here. So we've got a, an image that's taken from um, about 80 meters up in the air. And what you see is a series of photos which have been stitched together. And also from the drone, we have elevation data. And that allows us to produce a digital elevation model. So the idea is that you produce a photo and a digital elevation model and you put them together, you combine the data. So this is a semi-transparent ortho photo that is draped on a digital elevation model. It sounds very complex, but all it is is it's elevation data and photographs combined together and you get the best of both worlds you're able to see more structures and you're able to, to map um, features that you don't see on photographs or features that you don't see on digital elevation models independently, but together you can, you can make a, a very powerful map. So this image shows you such a map and there are very similar structures to this in um, Saudi Arabia. And the map looks a bit like this. The important thing is that we can see three different generations of features. We can see some features in yellow, which formed first. We can see some features in orange, which formed second. And the third package of features, which are green, um, form a third. And how do we know that? Well, they just simply show cross-cutting relationships. And the orange structures, for example, they bulge and deflect and warp and deform the, the features in, in unit one. And the orientation is also slightly different. So this made us think a lot that actually um, the surfaces don't just form in one sim simple, um, in, in one, one go, they form over a period of time. And that means that these unconformities that you see, these striated surfaces actually record critical information about ice flow and ice retreat. They contain much more information than we'd previously thought. We knew that structures like this in Saudi Arabia in the Ordovician, they form through the deformation of soft sediment, 
and lots of fabulous structures to describe. But these cross-cutting relationships really shed a whole new light on, on the development of these, these features. Okay, so what, what does it mean? Well, like ever, we, we have to go and look at the ground. We can't just work on image data alone. So this is a very important development because it allows us to, to map spatial relationships, but it's no substitute for doing field geology and going uh, onto the ground and describing the structures. So we, we do that in this way. And um, you can see, unfortunately, the pictures look a bit squashed on my screen for some reason. Um, but you can see these overstepping relationships in photo C, for example you can see little aprons, little um, apron-like features. They look like miniature alluvial fans coming down from a, uh, um, a mountain range into the desert. Um, and they flow down into the, into the trough and they conceal the striations. We've got evidence of intraformational striations in the top right-hand corner. And by that, I mean that the, 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 the structures form in the sediment column as the ice flows over the area and it shears and deforms the sediment. So we've got evidence for ductile deformation like that. And in the bottom right hand corner, photo E, we've got some deformation bands that you can see. So evidence that locally the, the sediment had been locking up, had been deforming in a, in a brittle way uh, to produce these deformation bands. Good. So the, the ground perspective is very, very important for understanding the processes. And um, by contrast, just to go straight back to the modern day glacier, this is the Gepatch Glacier in Austria that um, uh, from a photo I took a few months ago. And I went under an ice cave and I saw these striations forming. And what you see on this photo is that the striations are basically um, going into and out of the of the slide and the ice is coming towards us as we're looking at it and these striations are just forming um, on hard bedrock and scratched material um, in this case this is um, a metamorphic rock but the things i've been showing you have been forming in soft sediment so they, they have a, a very very different set of structures and because they're forming in soft sediment they provide an archive of, um, of change in the, in the ice sheet in a way that these structures that you can see in this slide in Austria don't show you. So going back to, back to South Africa, now we've had that, that quick revision with modern day striations. We can see these bulges in the top left hand corner flexing and, and, and uh, warping pre-existing um, uh, structures. We can see things called flutes in the bottom left hand corner and in the top right. Uh, how do we know they're, they're glacial anyway? Well we've got diamectites that are stratified with some beautiful drop stones inside. So um, lots and lots of clear evidence for, for, for glaciation and striation. So how do they form? Could they form from a glacier? Could they form from through an iceberg, something like this. And this is a big question because if you see the structures in isolation and you say it's formed through a big ice sheet, then that's a, clearly a very different idea to having a, an iceberg that can float around freely in the sea in the North Atlantic today, big icebergs. The Titanic, for example, a very famous collision with an iceberg, well away from an ice sheet. So it's fundamentally important to determine a glacier or an iceberg. And we think we can do this because we've got these three cross-cutting phases. So in this model, we've got phase one, you get the initial development of striations and scratching on the soft sediment. In phase two, um, you get a little bit of floating of the ice margin because the ice is, is terminating in the sea. And that allows it to bounce on the substrate and plow into it and deform the pre-existing structures. And then moving to the third phase, we have um, again, renewed grounding and incision and fluting 
and finally ending up with the picture what we have on the right hand side which is a series of laterally cross-cutting um, zones so very interesting because it tells us about what the ice sheet was doing dynamically on something that you would have previously dismissed as just an unconformity good so we've um, covered a lot of ground today and um, I just want to finish off with a couple of conclusions for you all um, I hope I've got the point across that the ancient glacial record is incredibly diverse I've shown you some examples that are of um, late Ordovician age and a late Carboniferous age from, um, from Africa principally and also from Saudi Arabia. I've also compared and contrasted these with deposits that are of the, formed in the present day and also from the Neoproterozoic and, and Paleoproterozoic records where they're dominated by diamectite. So it's very hard uh, if you look at a textbook to expect to come away with all of these classic things that you, you often read. Often the record um, depends on the age of the glaciation that you see. So you have to be creative and think a little bit about why, um, about what your glaciation um, will be telling you. Okay, the other thing that's um, important is it's okay to say, it's okay to admit that it's hard to demonstrate that deposits are glacial. Um, sometimes the evidence is very, very fragmentary. And in some cases, in the Neoproterozoic, in the Snowball Earth event, some basins have really good evidence for glaciation, whereas others have very poor evidence to no evidence for glaciation. And that's difficult. But if there is evidence for glaciation, either using uh, things like um, careful thin section analysis, micromorphology, incorporating fabric analyses, using satellite image interpretation, using um, aerial photography, with enough effort you should be able to extract the glacial signature from them. And I think that this bird's eye view approach that I tried to emphasise in the latter part of the presentation will probably lead to very important breakthroughs in both the late Ordovician and the late Paleozoic Ice Age records in the future. So the, the final message, the final lesson is maybe that to have these new approaches, in addition to going along with the geological hammer and making the sedimentary logs, which remain critical, uh, but having these processes um, as well uh, is essential to understand that the complex geometries of ancient glacial deposits um, particularly important when they're fluid reservoirs in rocks. So with that I'd like to say thank you very much uh, for in inviting me to give this uh, webinar and I hope you've enjoyed it. All right, uh... On behalf of uh, EAG and APG student chapter, would like to thank uh, Professor Dan for this comprehensive and an extraordinary example of the glacial sediments from different parts of the world. So, as I mentioned before, we have uh, still have time for questions and answer. So, uh, let me try first asking if anyone from outside, because we have around eleven who are joining us in this webinar. So if you have any question, just uh, switch on your microphone. You can ask any questions. If not, maybe we'll give chance to audience here to ask the question. No? I don't know. So anyone from here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, first thank you for the presentation. Uh, yeah. You're okay? Uh, do you hear me, Professor? Yes, yes, perfectly. Yeah. Thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. Uh, could you get back to the slide before the conclusion for the multi-story phases? Uh, yeah. I couldn't understand how you got to this conclusion, uh, to define the three 
stages of or three phases of the glaciation. Can, no, can you no just problem. repeat it? Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no problem at all. Um, the secret lies in looking at the the cross-cutting relationships that you that you can map. And um, if I take you back to this slide, uh, this is what we're really uh, basing that on. So hopefully you can see that there's yellow, orange and green packages of sediment. And uh, when you look at the orientations of the striations inside those packages of sediment, uh, together with evidence for cross-cutting relationships, uh, then you, you have to have three phases of um, three phases to explain the generation of this of, of this unconformity okay and so what we think is that um, what I've done with the if I go back to the, the conclude this this slide I try to take you through the evolution of these phases from phase one to phase two to phase three to phase four so the point is that we currently look at something in the present day like this with these three colors that are shown and only by looking carefully at mapping the, the cross-cutting relationships can you demonstrate that you have to have this forming over, over a period of time. So that means that the, 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 the surface can't form just in one go. You need to have some more complex dynamics, um, perhaps some ice floating and then the ice grounds back down onto the seafloor to produce these, these structures that we see. Does, does that does that explain things a little bit better? Yeah, it does. Uh, can, can we get um, an absolute uh, aging or uh, dating be between these events or they are just seasonal, the three glaciation phases? Well, it would be lovely to have, um, it would really be lovely to have um, new new dates on these. Um, the next, currently people have been focusing on trying to date uh, things like this, the diamectite that I can show you here, and, and black shales above, because um, the previous thinking was that there was a lot of diachroneity in the glacial cycles across South Africa. A new uranium lead dating of zircons by people like Neil Griffiths in University of Dave, uh, California, Davis, have been able to show new paper in geology that, that they're probably forming at the same time. The next phase of work would be to try and date each of those small phases. That hasn't been done. This is this is brand new and um, and I'd love to see, it would be great to see if you could actually have a, a statistically significant age difference between each of those phases. Quite whether you could get that with uranium lead dating of zircons, I don't know. Uh, but it would be exciting to know the answer. Um, so that's a long way of saying we don't currently know, but I think uh, it's it's worth well worth investigating. That's Sorry, Professor, but is there any possibility that they could represent uh, the three phases uh, just a, uh, an annual event, glaciation event, a seasonal one? Could is there any possibility? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, absolutely. At the moment, we simply don't have the time. We don't simply don't have the age constraint to, to know. Um, so I, I, I don't want you to leave with the impression that this surface is, uh, these surfaces can record events that, that cover millions of years. You're probably right. They form in a, in a, in a fairly short time frame. And, and we know that in, you know, in, in examples where the ice um, meets the sea and you have tidal processes then those tidal processes can 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 raise and lower the the ice margin even on a, on a daily basis or a diurnal basis really appreciate your comments thank you so much thank you you're welcome I should have shown you the drone this is the drone I didn't know if the if the camera was working during the uh, uh, the webinar uh, but this is this is the thing that was used to uh, used to take the the, the images, and um, obviously this is now out of date. Technology moves very quickly, and you can get ones which are um, three times smaller uh, to, to do the same job. Yeah, my name is uh, Babalola. Thanks for the lecture. It's very 
informative and very detailed. I was just puzzled by your method of correlation. You, at the initial stage, when you were talking about the Saudi Arabia and some of the outcrop you've looked at, you tend to use, uh, you said it's problematic, correlating based on the datology. Uh, you now went to use subsurface, subsurface data. But mm -hmm. more often than not, when you have logs, like our experience in uh, subsurface Robohale, we had logs and we had all these kind of uh, fishes we've shown, but we found mm -hmm. it difficult to do the correlation. You must have met uh, Abdallah Kubali uh, in Oman the other day. Uh, we had this problem of uh, being able to correlate some of the, the amitite we found in the subsurface of Bukhali. Do you think of any other possible means of uh, effecting the correlation just other than using gamma ray log or any of the other logs? It would yeah. be okay if we have a biostatigraphic uh, control. Uh, in this case, we cannot get marine organism, or likely you get a paninomorph or some other things that you can use to, especially in the muddy intervals. So I was just thinking, would it mean how possible can we arrive with this kind of uh, problem we face? In terms well, what, of ideal fishes. Yeah, so I, I appreciate that it's, it's, it's difficult and, and I don't want to leave people with the idea that it's a, it's a, a pointless or hopeless, hopeless exercise. Um, I think it, it I'll make make two one comment about the outcrop and then talk about the um, talk about the core. Uh, I think it's I think because I can see Saeed is still there. It's a re reasonable thing to uh, to say that we were discussing this at incredible detail at the outcrop. And as a scientist, you're you're left with e the possibility of trying to force a correlation, or to accept that on the basis of current um, current methodologies it, it it can't be done with this technique but um, with perhaps with large-scale thin sections like this this is an example of a, a thin section from um, some near proterozoic diamectite that's in Death Valley um, we're trying to um, think about extracting fabric um, data from them so perhaps a bit like paleocurrent work, if you see that there are different diamectites with fabrics and different orientations, there may be a way to, to argue for a correlation of, of those difficult rocks. And so, you know, core, core material like this with the, um, that I've got here, this, this comes from, from Australia actually. Um, this is exactly what we're, what we're trying to do. And it's basically borrowing a lot of the, um, techniques and uh, incredible work that, that people like Emrys Phillips have uh, have employed so well for, for the for the Pleistocene so modern or, and, and Pleistocene glacial sediments some serious structural geology going into detail with the fabric analysis that might be that might be an approach and um, you know that might might well lead to to something useful at least it's more objective doing it like that, extracting fabric analyses and directional data than saying, well, actually this one is also gray. So maybe I'll correlate the light gray and the light gray diamectites together. Uh, I'm, I'm exaggerating obviously, but uh, I, 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 th I think the fabric analysis might be useful. Hello, Dan again. Uh, Hi, sorry. Thank you very much for this impressive present presentation. Really, I cannot overestimate how uh, tough it is to gather all the information from glaciations from 2.2 billion years all the way to present day glaciations. Uh, but it's really kind of it's emphasizing the the task that we need to how far we need to go before we could really pinpoint one glaciations and then examine the detail out of it. Uh, so. Very well done on that one. Uh, I would love to do a PhD with you. Uh, having said that, <laughs> uh, we could uh, kind of get back on the point uh, that you mentioned. Uh, sorry, I yeah, forgot your name. But... Let me do Babaluna. Babaluna? Okay. So Babaluna kind of raised a point uh, that uh, it's it's regarding to, to the age dating. And uh, somebody else also mentioned a point with regards to age dating. 
And I think the difficulties that we're dealing with right now in the Anasia Sea, as, as well as the Sahara, is, is really it has to do with that. And what you've seen is kind of the efforts of one person or one group, very, very small group, uh, glacial sedimentologists that is worldwide, trying to tackle all of these different glaciations worldwide. But from the work that we are trying to do at Aramco, we, we've reached to a point where we could identify some minerals that are very, very specific to certain glaciations. And within these glaciations, there are some minerals that sometimes, we haven't really gone all the way to the, to the end of that research, but sometimes these minerals are present within one basin versus the other basin. So I could give you an example of monzite, for example, that's, that's kind of a mineral that is, is quite common in Anasia Sea. Uh, we're, we were not really done with it yet, but uh, I think we've reached a point where we could say that we could uh, start correlating between different events based on these uh, or the content of this mineral. Uh, the research is still it's in, uh, in its infancy, so this is where KVPM could help in with manpower. Uh, and hopefully with collaborations with Dan Lahar and his team over there, we could start having more people trying to experiment and, and extracting more data out of these glacial deposits. Uh, and that is my bit. Yeah, chemo stratigraphy would be chemo stratigraphy would be an aspect that can be looked at. Uh, but you are talking of heavy minerals, right? Yes. Uh, well, right, you know, is... Mostly it should be heavy mineral because if Okay. Well, you consider transportation or contamination from. Okay. We are here, so you can talk to us. Well, you guys are talking to the right person, so here's the guy who can do it. All right. Any more questions? Or I think we are good in time. Yeah. So, all right. Um, I think the, this is the end of the, the webinar. Uh, again, we are from from uh, AAPG and EAG student chapter. I'd like to say thanks to Prof. Dan for this uh, interesting talk. So perhaps maybe later if you visit Saudi Arabia, we would like to invite, have you invite you to to give seminar uh, in front of us uh, directly just let let us know whenever you have chance to visit saudi arabia so we'll arrange also a seminar for you here so i think we all good thank you just uh, give applause to prof dan and thank you very much have a nice thank you. evening yeah <laughs> thank you very much